Welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and following on last week's video, I wanted to continue with General Hood's reminiscences of the Civil War, and the Battle of Chickamauga in particular. Hood was wounded at Gettysburg, where he would lose function of one of his arms. Just over two months after that historic battle, he would take part in the largest battle in the Western theater of the war, when General Lee would send one of his most trusted commanders, James Longstreet, and his entire corps to bolster the forces of the Army of Tennessee under General Braxton Bragg. This is where we will pick up with Hood and his Civil War journeys, on the eve of the Battle of Chickamauga. I arrived at Ringgold, Georgia on the afternoon of the 18th, and there received an order from General Bragg to proceed on to the road to Reed's Bridge and assume command of the column, then advancing on the Federals. I had my horse to leap from the train, mounted with one arm in a sling, and about 3 p.m. joined our forces, then under the direction of General Bushrod Johnson and in line of battle. A small body of Federal cavalry was posted upon an eminence a short distance beyond. On my arrival upon the field, I met for the first time after the charge at Gettysburg a portion of my old troops, who received me with a touching welcome. After a few words of greeting exchanged with General Johnson, I assumed command in accordance with the instructions I had received, ordered the line to be broken by file and into the road, sent a few picked men to the front in support of Forrest's cavalry, and began to drive the enemy at a rapid pace. In a short time we arrived at Reed's Bridge across the Chickamauga, and discovered the Federals drawn up in battle arrayed beyond the bridge, which they had partially destroyed. I ordered forward some pieces of artillery, opened fire, and at the same time threw out flankers to effect a crossing above and below and joined in the attack. Our opponents quickly retreated. We repaired the bridge and continued to advance till darkness closed in upon us. When we bivouacked in line, near a beautiful residence which had been fired by the enemy and was then almost burned to the ground, we had driven the Federals back a distance of six or seven miles. Meantime, the main body of the army crossed the Chickamauga at different points and concentrated that night in the vicinity of my command. General Bragg having formed his plan of attack the following morning, I was given, in addition to my own division, the direction of Kershaw's and Johnson's divisions with orders to continue the advance. We soon encountered the enemy in strong force and a heavy engagement ensued. All that day we fought, slowly but steadily gaining ground. Fierce and desperate grew the conflict as the foe stubbornly yielded before our repeated assaults. We drove him step by step, a distance of fully one mile. When nightfall brought about a secession of hostilities and the men slept upon their arms. In the evening, according to my custom in Virginia under General Lee, I rode back to Army Headquarters to report to the Commander-in-Chief the result of the day upon my part of the line. I there met for the first time several principal officers of the Army of Tennessee, and to my surprise not one spoke in a sanguine tone regarding the results of the battle in which we were then engaged. I found the gallant Breckenridge, whom I had known from early youth, seated by the root of a tree, with a heavy slouch hat upon his head. When in the course of brief conversation I stated that we would rout the enemy the following day, he sprang to his feet exclaiming, My dear Hood, I am delighted to hear you say so. You give me renewed hope. God grant it may be so. After receiving orders from General Bragg to advance the next morning, as soon as the troops on my right moved to the attack, I returned to the position occupied by my forces, and camped the remainder of the night with General Buckner. As I had nothing with me to save, that which I had brought from the train upon my horse. Nor did my men have a single wagon or even ambulance in which to convey the wounded. They were destitute of almost everything. I might say except pride, spirit, and forty rounds of ammunition to the man. During the night, after a hard day's fight by his old and trusty troops, General Longstreet joined the army. He reported to General Bragg after I had left army headquarters, and the next morning when I had arranged my columns for the attack, and was awaiting the signal on the right to advance, he rode up and joined me. He inquired concerning the formation of my lines, the spirit of our troops, and the effect produced upon the enemy by our assault. I informed him that the feeling of the officers and men were never better, that we had driven the enemy fully one mile that day before, and that we would rout him before sunset. This distinguished general instantly responded with the confidence which had so often contributed to his extraordinary success, that we would of course whip them, 
and drive him from the field. I could but exclaim that I was rejoiced to hear him so express himself, as he was the first general I had met since my arrival who talked of victory. He was assigned to the direction of the left wing and placed me in command of five divisions, Kershaw's, A.P. Stewart's, Bushrod Johnson's, and Heinemann's, together with my own. The latter formed the center of my line with Heinemann upon my left, Johnson and Stewart on the right, and Kershaw in reserve. About 9 a.m. the firing on the right commenced. We immediately advanced and engaged the enemy, when followed a terrible roar of musketry from right to left. Onward we moved, nerved with a determination to become masters of that hotly contested field. We wrestled with the resolute foe till about 2.30 p.m., when from a skirt of timber to our left, a body of Federals rushed down upon the immediate flank and rear of the Texas Brigade, which was forced to suddenly change front. Some confusion necessarily arose. I was at the time on my horse and upon a slight ridge about 300 yards distant, and galloped down the slope in the midst of the men who speedily corrected their alignment. At this moment, Kershaw's splendid division, led by its gallant commander, came forward as Heinemann advanced to the attack a little further to the left. Kershaw's line formed, as it were, an angle with that of the Federal line, then in view in an open space near the wood. I rode rapidly to his command, ordered a change of front forward on his right, which was promptly executed under a galing fire. With a shout along my entire front, the Confederates rushed forward, penetrated into the wood, over and beyond the enemy's breastworks, and thus achieved another glorious victory for our arms. About this time I was pierced with a mini-ball in the upper third of the right leg. I turned from my horse upon the side of the crushed limb and fell, strange to say since I was commanding five divisions, into the arms of some of the troops of my old brigade, which I had directed so long a period and upon so many fields of battle. Long and constant service with this noble brigade must prove a sufficient apology for a brief reference at this juncture to its extraordinary military record from the hour of its first encounter with the enemy at Ethelm's Landing on York River in 1862 to the surrendered Appomattox Courthouse. In almost every battle in Virginia it bore a conspicuous part. It acted as the advance guard of Jackson when he moved upon McClellan around Richmond and almost without an exceptional instance, it was among the foremost of Longstreet's corps in an attack or pursuit of the enemy. It was also, as a rule, with the rear guard of the rear guard of this corps, whenever fallen back before the adversary. If a ditch was to be leaped or fortified position to be carried, General Lee knew no better troops upon which to rely. In truth, its signal achievements in the War of Secession have never been surpassed in the history of nations. The members of this historic band were possessed of a streak of superstition, as in fact I believe all men to be, and it may be here to prove of interest to cite an instance thereof. I had a favorite roan horse named by them Jeff Davis. Whenever he was in condition I rode him in battle, and remarkable as it may seem, he generally received the bullets and bore me unscathed. In this battle he was severely wounded on Saturday the following day. I was forced to resort to a valuable mare in my possession, and late in the afternoon was shot from the saddle. At Gettysburg I had been unable to mount him on the field in consequence of lameness. In this engagement I had also been shot from the saddle. Thus the belief among the men became nigh general that, when mounted on old Jeff, the bullets could not find me. This spirited and fearless animal performed his duty through the war and after which he received tender care from General Jefferson and family of Texas until death when he was buried with appropriate honors. When wounded, I was borne to the hospital of my old division, where a most difficult operation was performed by Dr. T.G. Richardson of New Orleans. He was at the time Chief Medical Officer of the Army of Tennessee and is now the President of the Medical Association of the United States. The day after the battle, I was carried upon a litter some 15 miles to the residence of Mr. Little, I remained there about one month under the attentive care of Mr. and Miss Little, the parents of the gallant Colonel Little, of my division, and under the able medical attendance of Dr. John T. Darby. I then received intelligence from General Bragg that the enemy was contemplating a raid to capture me. I at once moved to Atlanta and thence to Richmond. General Longstreet has since the war informed me that he telegraphed the authorities of the Confederate government from the battlefield on the day I was wounded, urging my promotion to the rank of Lieutenant General 
I hope you enjoyed this account of General Hood's time at the Battle of Chickamauga. One thing that struck me was General Hood's perception of the generals in the Army of Tennessee. To him, they looked discouraged, and rightfully so. They had yet to win a battle in the West, or at least a major one. And I think that could be seen on their faces when General Hood went to headquarters that night of September 18th. Even Breckenridge was happy to see a friendly face, and one that actually proposed victory instead of always being downtrodden and seeing defeat in every battle. But that's what they had been used to. They, they had been defeated, or even at Perryville where they won a tactical victory but a strategic loss, they still had to retreat from the field. So General Hood's impression of the Army of Tennessee and its commanders was very telling for the Western theater and the Confederacy as a whole. I hope you enjoyed this video. I think I'm going to do another video on General Hood for next week. Him talking about the battles of Franklin and Nashville, which was one of his most disastrous of commands.